This week's reading is from Luke 9, 28 through 33. Now about eight days after the day, Jesus put Ted, Peter, and John and James and went to the mountain to pray. And while he was praying, the appearance of his face changed, and his clothes became dazzling white. Suddenly they saw two men, Moses and Elijah, talking to him. They appeared in glory and were speaking of his departure, which he was about to accomplish at Jerusalem. Now Peter and his companions were weighed down with sleep. But since they had stayed awake, they saw his glory and the two men who stood with him. Just as they were leaving, Peter said to Jesus, Master, it is good for us to be here. Let, him, let us make three dwellings, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah, not knowing what he had said. While he was saying this, a cloud came and overshadowed them, and they were terrified as they entered the cloud. And from then the cloud came a voice that said, This is my son, my chosen. Listen to him. When the voice had spoken, Jesus was found alone, and they kept silent, and in those days told no one any of the things they had seen. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. Today we come to the conclusion of our sermon series on Jesus' firsts. We started with his baptism, his call to ministry, his first step. We learned more about Jesus and his abundant generosity with his first sign, turning water into wine. We considered Jesus' first words, the scripture he chose to read and how he interpreted it and teaching it to the crowd in his home synagogue. And finally today, we see Jesus' first glory, his transfiguration, a message about who Jesus is and what he will become. The passage for today opens with the setting for what will take place. We read that it is about eight days after these sayings. What sayings is the author talking about? A few verses earlier, Jesus asks the disciples, Who do the crowds say that I am? They offer a few options, Elijah, John the Baptist, and others. And Peter correctly names Jesus as the Messiah of God. Jesus then foretells his death, stating that the Son of Man must undergo great suffering and be rejected by the elders, chief priests, and scribes, and be killed, and on the third day be raised. Jesus goes on to tell them the requirements for discipleship, to deny yourselves, take up your cross daily, and follow him. About a week after Jesus declares who he is and what these requirements are for following him, he goes with Peter, John, and James up a mountain to pray. While this seems like just the setting for what will be a mysterious and magnificent event, we can learn a lot from this short description. Jesus had been busy. He had been feeding the 5,000. He had been healing people. He had calmed the storm, and he was continually teaching. And as Luke often reminds us, Jesus took time to pray. He took time to get away from the crowd, to join with his closest friends, those in whom he found support and comfort, and he retreated. He spent time talking with God. He spent time restoring his soul. We are called to do the same. We are to go outside of the church and help the needy, bring peace and care for the marginalized, just as we have considered for the past few weeks. But we must also take care of ourselves. We just sang about this in our opening hymn. Take time to be holy, speak oft with thy Lord, abide in him always, and feed on his word. What would our lives look like if we followed this example of Jesus, if we did what we sing? 
Jesus and his closest friends go up a mountain to pray. And the mountain isn't just a pretty place or a place where others may not find them. Mountains were traditional sites for encounters with God. Mountains were what has now been coined as a thin place. A thin place is a Celtic term for those rare locales where the distance between heaven and earth collapses. They are places where it is easy to see God. The disciples and Jesus go to a thin place, a place where communication with God is easy, where they feel closest to God, and they pray. What happens next, however, is mysterious. As Donald Luther has indicated, there are no words or phrases Epiphany, theophany, Christophany, or even revelation of the divine that are adequate to the task of describing what happened on that mountaintop. We read that while Jesus was praying, the appearance of his face changed and his clothes became dazzling white. Suddenly they saw two men, Moses and Elijah, talking to him. Wow. Jesus went to pray and the disciples saw him physically change and speak with two men who had been gone for centuries. It is particularly interesting that the two people mentioned are Moses and Elijah. Moses is representative of the law and Elijah is representative of the prophets, indicating that Jesus has come to fulfill Israel's law and prophecies. Jesus speaks with Elijah and Moses about his departure, which he was about to accomplish in Jerusalem. And scholar N.T. Point, Wright points out that the word for departure is exodus. And Luke means us to understand that in several senses. It can mean exodus, like Exodus in the Old Testament, a departure or a going away. It can also serve as a euphemism for death. But the reason Luke has chosen this word, according to Wright, is that in his death Jesus will enact an event just like the great Exodus from Egypt. In the new Exodus, Jesus will lead all God's people out of slavery of sin and death, and home to their promised inheritance. Jesus is heading towards his death, but his death is not the end. And this moment of transfiguration of Jesus' first glory may be considered as a preview of Easter. Here he is discussing his death with dazzling white clothes, and speaking to those who have gone on before him. And on Easter, he will be raised from the dead, showing us that while death does not need to be frightening, because there is something more. The three disciples almost missed it. The text says that they were weighed down with sleep, they almost slept through Jesus' first glory. They almost missed it, but they didn't. They managed to stay awake and see this magnificent event. And so Peter suggests that they make three dwellings, one each for Jesus, Moses, and Elijah. And as Sharon Ring points out, Peter's plan to build booths expresses the human longing both to honor those persons who are important to us and to preserve in some way our glimpses of divine transcendence. Peter wanted a tangible way to remember and honor what had just occurred. It also reflects this culture of hospitality, something that was so important to them. The text continues, however, that Peter didn't know what was just said. Peter just doesn't get it. 
He doesn't understand the full implication of the event. He doesn't understand how this is foreshadowing Jesus' death and resurrection. He doesn't understand that he can't stay in that moment, but they must come down from the mountain and return to their lives. At this moment, as if the event hadn't been mysterious enough, a cloud comes and overshadows them, and a voice comes from the cloud saying, This is my son, my chosen. Listen to him. Throughout the Bible, there are numerous times when God appears as a cloud. In Exodus 16, as Aaron speaks to the Israelites, the glory of God appears as a cloud. A few chapters later, God tells Moses, I am going to come to you in a dense cloud. And in Acts, we hear that Jesus ascends to the heavens and a cloud took him out of their sight. And then in our story, the voice from the cloud declares Jesus as God's son, the chosen one. And this declaration may sound familiar. At Jesus' baptism, a dove descended and the voice from heaven declared, You are my son, the beloved. With you I am well pleased. A declaration to Jesus. But here the voice declares to the world, This is my son, my chosen. And then the voice commands, Listen to him. The voice is speaking to those who will carry on Jesus' ministry after his death. Listen to him. Learn what you can from him while he is still with you. Listen. While this is the end of the passage for today, it is always important to view scripture in context. And immediately following Jesus' transfiguration, Jesus and his friends descend the mountain, and they are met with chaos, as the disciples have been unable to heal a sick boy. It is particularly interesting that while there are numerous differences between the Gospels as to which stories they include and when, when they include them, each of the Gospel writers follows with this story. As N.T. Wright suggests, they seem to be telling us that these two go together. We go to the mountaintop. We go to the thin places, the places where we feel closest to God, and we rejuvenate ourselves. We spend time with God and the people closest to us. We replenish our souls. We take time to be holy. But then we must come back. We must come down from the mountain. While it would be glorious to stay in those places, we must depart. We must come back to the world and continue our work as Jesus' disciples. Just as Jesus was transfigured on the mountain, we must work with God towards the transformation of the world. Desmond Tutu uses this idea of transformation quite a bit in his writing. He believes that God places us in the world as his fellow workers, agents of transfiguration. We work with God so that injustice is transfigured into justice, so there will be more compassion and caring there will be more laughter and joy. There will be more togetherness in God's world. Are you spending time with God? Are you spending time in the thin places where you feel the presence of the Holy One? Are you confiding in those closest to you? And then are you coming down from the mountain? to serve as Jesus' disciple, the one who follows him and participates in the transfiguration 
of the world. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen.